The Planet with No Nightmare by Jim Harmon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Walker. The Planet with No Nightmare by Jim Harmon. The creatures on the little planet were real bafflers. The first puzzle about them was that they died so easily. The second was that they didn't die at all. Chapter 1 Tension eased away as the spaceship settled down on its metallic haunches and they savoured a safe planet fall. Ekstrom fingered loose the cinches of his deceleration couch. He sighed. An exploration camp would mean things would be simpler for him. He could hide his problem from the others more easily. Trying to keep secret what he did alone at night was very difficult under the close conditions on board a ship in space. Ryan hefted his bulk up and supported it on one elbow. He rubbed his eyes sleepily with one huge paw. Ekstrom, Nogal, you guys okay? Nothing wrong with me that couldn't be cured, Nogal said. He didn't say what would cure him. He had been explaining all during the trip what he needed to make him feel like himself. His small black eyes darted inside the olive oval of his face. Ekstrom, Ryan insisted. Okay. Well, let's take a ground level look at the country around here. The fax support rolled open on the landscape. A range of bluffs hugged the horizon, the colour of decaying moss. Above them, the sky was the black of space, or the almost equal black of the winter sky above Minneapolis, seen against neon-lit snow. That cold, empty sky was full of fire and light. It seemed almost a magnification of the galaxy itself, of the Milky Way, blown up by some master photographer. This fiery swathe was actually only a belt of minor planets, almost like the asteroid belt in the original solar system. These planets were much bigger, nearly all capable of holding an atmosphere. But to the infuriation of scientists, for no known reason, not all of them did. This would be the fifth mapping expedition to the planetoids of Yancey 6 in three generations. They lay months away from the nearest Earth star by jump drive, and no one knew what they were good for, although it was felt that they would probably be good for something if it could only be discovered, much like the continent of Antarctica in ancient history. How can a planet with so many neighbours be so lonely? Ryan asked. He was the captain, so he could ask questions like that. Some can be lonely in a crowd, Nogal said elaborately. What will we need outside, Ryan? Ekstrom asked. No helmets, the captain answered. We can breathe out there all right. It just won't be easy. This old world lost all of its helium and trace gases long ago. Nitrogen and oxygen are about it. Ryan, look over there, Nogal said. Animals, ringing the ship. Think they're intelligent? Maybe hostile? I think they're dead, Ekstrom interjected quietly. I get no readings from them at all. Sonic, electronic, galvanic, all blank. According to these needles, they're stone dead. Ekstrom, you and I will have a look, Ryan said. You hold down the fort, Nogal. Take it easy. Easy, Nogal confirmed. I heard a story once about a rookie who got excited when the captain stepped outside, and he couldn't get an encephalographic reading on him. Me? I know the mind of an officer works in a strange and unfathomable manner. I'm not worried about you misreading the dials, Nogal. Just about a lug like you reading them at all. Remember, when the little hand is straight up, that's negative. Positive results start when it goes towards the hand you use to make your mark. But I'm ambidextrous. Ryan told him what he could do then. Ekstrom smiled and followed the captain through the airlock with only a glance at the lapel gauge of his coverall. 
the strong negative field his suit set up would help to repel bacteria and insects. Actually, the types of infection that could attack a warm-blooded mammal were not infinite, and over the course of the last few hundred years, adequate defences had been found for all basic categories. He wasn't likely to come down with hot chills and puzzling striped fever. They ignored the ladder down to the planet's surface, and, with only a glance at the seismological gauge to judge surface resistance, dropped to the ground. It was a day, but in the thin atmosphere contrasts were sharp between light and shadow. They walked from midnight to noon, noon to midnight, and came to the beast sprawled on its side. Ekstrom nudged it with a boot. Hey, this is pretty close to a warthog. Uh-huh, Ryan admitted. One of the best matches I've ever found. Well, it has to happen. Statistical average and all. Still, it sometimes gives you a creepy feeling to find a rabbit or a snapping turtle on some strange world. It makes you wonder if this exploration business isn't all some big joke, and somebody has been everywhere before you even started. The surveyor looked sidewise at the captain. The big man seldom gave out with such thoughts. Ekstrom cleared his throat. What shall we do with this one? Dissect it? Ryan nudged it with his toe, following Ekstrom's example. I don't know, Stormy. It sure as hell doesn't look like any dominant intelligent species to me. No hands, for one thing. Of course, that's not definite proof. No, it isn't, Ekstrom said. I think we better let it lay until we get a clearer picture of the ecological setup around here. In the meantime, we might be thinking on the problem all these dead beasts represent. What killed them? It looks like we did when we made Blast Down. But what about our landing was lethal to the creatures? Radiation, Ekstrom suggested. The planet is very low in radiation from mineral deposits and the atmosphere seems to shield out most of the solar output. Any little dose of radiation might knock off these critters. I don't know about that. Maybe it would work the other way, maybe because they have had virtually no radioactive exposures and don't have any R's stored up, they could take a lot of without harm. Then maybe it was the shock wave we sent up. Or maybe it's sheer xenophobia, they curl up and die at the sight of something strange and alien, like a spaceship. Maybe, the captain admitted. At this stage of the game, anything could be possible. But there's one possibility I particularly don't like. And that is? Suppose it was not us that killed these aliens. Suppose it is something right on the planet, native to it. I just hope it doesn't work on Earthmen too. These critters went real sudden. Ekstrom lay in his bunk and thought. The camp is quiet. The Earthmen made camp outside the spaceship. There was no reason to leave the comfortable quarters inside the ship, except that, faced with the possibility of sleeping on solid ground, they simply had to get out. The camp was a cluster of aluminium bubbles, ringed with a spy web to alert the Earthmen to the approach of any being. Each man had a bubble to himself, privacy after the long period of enforced intimacy on board the ship. Ekstrom lay in his bunk and listened to the sounds of the night on Yancey 6 138. There was a keening of wind and a cracking of the frozen ground. Insects there were on the world, but they were frozen solid during the night, only to revive and thaw in the morning sun. The bunk he lay on was much more uncomfortable than the acceleration couches on board, yet he knew the others were sleeping more soundly, now that they had renewed their contact with the matter that had birthed them to send them riding high vacuum. Ekstrom was not asleep. Now there could be an end to the pretending. He threw off the light blanket and swung his feet off the bunk to the floor. Ekstrom stood up. There was no longer any need to hide, but what was there to do? What had changed for him? He no longer had to lie in his bunk all night, his eyes closed, pretending to sleep. 
In privacy, he could walk around, leave the light on, read. It was small comfort for insomnia. Ekstrom never slept. Some doctors had informed him he was mistaken about this. Actually, they said, he did sleep, but so shortly and fitfully that he forgot. Others admitted he was absolutely correct. He never slept. His body processes only slowed down enough for him to dispel fatigue poisons. Occasionally, he fell into a waking, gritty-eyed stupor, but he never slept. Never at all. Naturally, he couldn't let his shipmates know this. Insomnia would ground him from the exploration service on physiological, if not psychological, grounds. He had to hide it. Over the years, he had buddies in space in whom he thought he could confide. The buddies invariably took advantage of him. Since he couldn't sleep anyway, he might as well stand their watches for them or write their reports. Where the hell did he get off threatening to report any laxness on their part to the captain? A man with insomnia had better avoid bad dreams of that kind if he knew what was good for him. Ekstrom had to hide his secret. In a camp, instead of shipboard, hiding the secret was easier, but the secret itself was just as hard. Ekstrom picked up a lightweight no-back from the ship's library. A book by Bloch, the famous 20th century expert on sex. He scanned a few lines on the social repercussions of a celebrated 19th century sex murderer, but he couldn't seem to concentrate on the weighty, pontifical, ponderous style. On impulse, he flipped up the heat control on his coverall and slid back the hatch of the bubble. Ekstrom walked through the alien grass and looked up at the unfamiliar constellations, smelling the frozen sterility of the thin air. Behind him, his mates stirred without waking. Chapter 2 Ekstrom was startled in the morning by a banging on the hatch of his bubble. It took him a few seconds to put his thoughts in order, and then he got up from the bunk where he had been resting sleeplessly. The angry, burnt, red face of Ryan greeted him. OK, Stormy, this isn't the place for fun and games. What did you do with them? Do with what? The dead beasties, all the dead animals laying around the ship. What are you talking about, Ryan? What do you think I did with them? I don't know. All I know is that they are gone. Gone? Ekstrom shouldered his way outside and scanned the veldt. There was no ring of animal corpses. Nothing. Nothing but wispy grass whipping in the keen breeze. I'll be damned, Ekstrom said. You are right now, buddy. XP doesn't like anybody mucking up primary evidence. Where do you get off, Ryan? Ekstrom demanded. Why pick me for your patsy? This has got to be some kind of local phenomenon. Why accuse a shipmate of being behind this? Listen, Ekstrom. I want to give you the benefit of every doubt, but you aren't exactly the model of a surveyor, you know. You've been riding on a pink ticket for six years, you know that. No, Ekstrom said. No, I didn't know that. You've been hiding things from me and Nogal, every jump we've made with you. Now comes this. It fits the pattern of secrecy and stealth you've been involved in. What could I do with your lousy dead bodies? What would I want with them? All I know is that you were outside the bubbles last night, and you were the only sentient being who came in or out of our alarm web. The tapes show that. Now all the bodies are missing, like they got up and walked away. It was not a new experience to Ekstrom. No, suspicion wasn't new to him at all. Ryan, there are other explanations for the disappearance of the bodies. Look for them, will you? I give you my word, I'm not trying to pull some stupid kind of joke or to deliberately foul up the expedition. Take my word, can't you? Ryan shook his head. I don't think I can. There's still such a thing as mental illness. You may not be responsible. Ekstrom scowled. 
Don't try anything violent, Stormy. I outweigh you 50 pounds, and I'm fast for a big man. I wasn't planning on jumping you. Why do you have to jump me the first time something goes wrong? You've only got a lot of formless suspicions. Look, Ekstrom, do you think I looked out the door and saw a lot of dead animals missing and immediately decided you did it to bedevil me? I've been up for hours, thinking, looking into this. You're the only possibility that's left. Why? The bodies are missing. What could it be? Scavengers? The web gives us a complete census on everything inside it. The only animals inside the ring are more warthogs and, despite their appearance, they aren't carnivorous, strictly grass eaters. Besides, no animal, no insect, no process of decay could completely consume animals without a trace. There are no bones, no hide, no nothing. You don't know the way bacteria works on this planet. Radiation is so low, it may be particularly virulent. That's a possible explanation, although it runs counter to all the evidence we've established so far. There's a much simpler explanation, Ekstrom. You. You hid the bodies for some reason. What other reason could you have for prowling around out here at night? I couldn't sleep. The words were in his throat, but he didn't use them. They weren't an explanation. They would open up more questions than they would answer. You're closing your eyes to the possibility of natural phenomenon, laying this on me. You haven't adequate proof and you know it. Ekstrom, when something's stolen, you always suspect a suspicious character before you get around to the possibility that the stolen goods melted into thin air. What? Ekstrom said with deadly patience. What do you think I could have possibly done with your precious dead bodies? You could have buried them. This is a big territory. We haven't been able to search every square foot of it. Ryan, it was 30 or 40 below zero last night. How the devil could I dig holes in this ground to bury anything? At 40 below, how could your bacteria function to rot them? Ekstrom could see he was facing prejudice. There was no need to keep talking, and no use in it. Still, some reflex made him continue to frame reasonable answers. I don't know what bacteria on this planet could do. Besides, that was only one example of a natural phenomenon. Look, Ekstrom, you don't have anything to worry about if you're not responsible. We're going to give you a fair test. What kind of test would it be, he wondered, and how fair? Nogal came trotting up lightly. Ryan, I found some more warthogs, and they keeled over as soon as they saw me. So it was xenophobia, Ekstrom ventured. The important thing, Ryan said, with a sidelong glance at the surveyor, is that now we've got what it takes to see if Ekstrom has been deliberately sabotaging the expedition. The body heat of the three men caused the air conditioner of the tiny bubble to labour. OK, Ryan breathed. We've got our eyes on you, Ekstrom, and the video circuits are wide open on the dead beasts. All we have to do is wait. We'll have a long wait, Nogal ventured. With Ekstrom here and the corpses out there, nothing is going to happen. That would be all the proof they needed, Ekstrom knew. Negative results would be positive proof to them. His pink ticket would turn pure red and he would be grounded for life if he got off without a rehabilitation sentence. But if nothing happened, it wouldn't really prove anything. There was no way to say that the conditions tonight were identical to the conditions the previous night. What had swept away those bodies might be comparable to a flash flood, something that occurred once a year or once in a century. And perhaps his presence outside was required in some subtle cause and effect relationship. All this test would prove, if the bodies didn't disappear, was only that conditions were not identical to conditions under which they did disappear. Ryan and Nogal were prepared to accept him, Ekstrom, as the missing element, the one ingredient needed to vanish the corpses, but it could very well be something else. 
Only Ekstrom knew that it had to be something else that caused the disappearances. Or did it? He faced up to the question. How did he know he was sane? How could he be sure that he hadn't stolen and hidden the bodies for some murky reason of his own? There was a large question as to how long a man could go without sleep, dreams and oblivion, and remain sane. Ekstrom forced his mind to consider the possibility. Could he remember every step he had taken the night before? It seemed to him that he could remember walking past the creature lying in the grass, then walking in a circle and coming back to the base. It seemed like that to him, but how could he know that it was true? He couldn't. There was no way he could prove, even to himself, that he had not disposed of those alien remains and then come back to this bubble, contented and happy at the thought of fooling those smug idiots who could sleep at night. How much longer do we have to wait? Nogal asked. We've been here nine hours, half a day. The bodies are right where I left them outside. There doesn't seem to be any more question. Ekstrom frowned. There was one question. He was sure that there was one question. Oh yes. The question was, how did he know he was sane? He didn't know, of course. That was as good an answer as any. Might as well accept it. Might as well let them do what they wanted with him. Maybe if he just gave up, gave in, maybe he could sleep then. Maybe he could. Ekstrom sat upright in his chair. No, that wasn't the answer. He couldn't know that he was sane, but then neither could anybody else. The point was, you had to go ahead living as if you were sane. That was the only way of living. Cosmos, Ryan gasped. Would you look at that? Ekstrom followed the staring gaze of the two men. On the video grid, one of the dead animals was slowly rising, getting up and walking away. A natural phenomenon, Ekstrom said. Suspended animation, Nogal ventured. Playing possum, Ryan concluded. Now came the time for apologies. Ekstrom had been through similar situations before. Ever since he had been found walking the corridors at college the night one of the girls had been attacked. He didn't want to hear their apologies. They meant nothing to him. It was not a matter of forgiving them. He knew the situation had not changed. They would suspect him just as quickly a second time. We're supposed to be an exploration team, Ekstrom said quickly. Let's get down to business. Why do you suppose these alien creatures fake death? Nogal shrugged his shoulders. Playing dead is easier than fighting. More likely, it's a method of fighting, Ryan suggested. They play dead until they see an opening, then rip. I think they're trying to hide some secret, Ekstrom said. What secret? Ryan demanded. I don't know, he answered. Maybe I'd better sleep on it. Chapter 3 Ryan observed his two crewmen confidently the next morning. I did some thinking last night. Great, Ekstrom thought. For that, you should get a hazardous duty bonus. This business is pretty simple, the captain went on. These pigs simply play possum. They go into a state of suspended animation when faced by a strange situation. Xenophobia. I don't see there's much more to it. Well, if you don't see that there's more to it, Ryan, Nogal began complacently. Wait a minute, Ekstrom interjective. That's a good theory. It may even be the correct one, but where's your proof? Look, Stormy, we don't have to have proof. Hell, we don't even have to have theories. We're explorers. We just make reports of primary evidence and let the scientists back home in the system figure them out. I want this thing cleared up, Ryan. Yesterday, you were accusing me of being some kind of psycho who was lousing up the expedition out of pure, pure... He searched for a term currently in use in mentology. Demonia. Maybe the boys back home will think the same. I want to be cleared. I guess you were cleared last night, Stormy Boy, Nogal put in. We saw one of the dead pigs get up and walk away. That didn't clear me, Ekstrom said. 
The other two looked like they had caught him cleaning wax out of his ear in public. No, Ekstrom said. We still have no proof of what caused the suspended animation of the pigs. Whatever caused it before caused it last night. You thought of accusing me, but you didn't think it through about how I could have disposed of the bodies, or after you found out about the pseudo-death, how I might have caused that. If I had some drug or something to cause it the first time, I could have a smaller dose or a slowly dissolving capsule for delayed effect. The two men stared at him, their eyes beginning to narrow. I could have done that, or either of you could have done the same thing. Me? Nogal protested. Where would my profit be in that? You both have an admitted motive. You hate my guts. I'm strange, different, suspicious. You could be trying to fray me. That's insubordination, Ryan grated. Accusations against a superior officer. Come off it, Ryan, Nogal sighed. I never saw a three-man spaceship that was run very taut. Besides, he's right. Beet juice flowed out of Ryan's swollen face. So, where does that leave us? Looking for proof of the cause of the pig's pseudo-death. Remember, I'll have to make counter-accusations against you two out of self-defence. Be reasonable, Stormy, Ryan pleaded. This might be some deep scientific mystery we could never discover in our lifetime. We might never get off this planet. That was probably behind his thinking all along, why he had been so quick to find a scapegoat to explain it all away. Explorers didn't have to have all the answers, or even theories. But if they ever wanted to get any place in the service, they damned well better. So what? Ekstrom asked. The service rates us as expendable, doesn't it? By Ekstrom's suggestion, they divided the work. Nogal killed pigs. All day he did nothing but scare the warthogs to death by coming near them. Ryan ran as faithful a check on the corpses as he could, both by eyeball observation and by radar, video and protect circuits. They lacked the equipment to program every corpse for every second, but a representative job could be done. Finally, Ekstrom went scouting for something else. He didn't know what he expected to find, but he somehow knew he would find something. He rode the traction scooter, so-called because it had no traction at all, no wheels, no slides, no contact with the ground or air, and he reflected that he was a suspicious character. All through life, he was going around suspecting everybody and now everything of having some dark secret they were trying to hide. A simple case of transference, he diagnosed in long discredited terminology. He had something to hide, his insomnia, so he thought everybody else had their guilty secret too. How could there be any deep secret to the pseudo-death on this world? It was no doubt a simple fear reaction, a retreat from a terrifying reality. How could he ever prove that it was more, or even exactly that? Internal glandular actions would be too subtle for a team of explorers to establish. They could only go on behaviour. What more, in the way of behaviour, could he really hope to establish? The pattern was clear. The pigs keeled over at any unfamiliar sight or sound, and recovered when they thought the coast was clear. That was it. All there was. Why did he stubbornly, stupidly, insist there was more to it? Actually, by his insistence, he was giving weight to the idea of the others that he was strange and suspicious himself. Under the normal, sane conditions of planet fall, the phobias and preoccupations of a space crew, nurtured in the close confines of a scout ship, wouldn't be taken seriously by competent men. But hadn't his subsequent behaviours given weight to Ryan's unfounded accusations of irrational sabotage? Wouldn't it seem that he was actually daring the others to prove his guilt? If he went on with the unorthodox behaviour, that was when Ekstrom saw the flying whale. 
Tension gripped Ekstrom tighter than he gripped the handlebars of his scooter. He was only vaguely aware of the passing scenery. He knew he should switch on the homing beacon and ride in on automatic, but it seemed like too much of an effort to flick his finger. As the tension rose, the capillaries of his eye swelled, and things began to white out for him. The rush of landscape became blurred, streaks of light and dark, now mostly faceless light. The flying whale, he had seen it. Moreover, he had heard it, smelt it, and felt it. He had released a jet of air with a distinctive sound and odour. It had blown against his skin, ruffled his hair. It had been real. But the flying whale couldn't have been real. Conditions on this planetoid were impossible for it. He knew planets and their life possibilities. A creature with a skeleton like that could have evolved here, but the atmosphere would never have supported his flesh and hide. Water bodies were of insufficient size. No, the whale was not native to this world. Then what, if anything, did this flying alien behemoth have to do with the pseudo-death of the local pig creatures? I'll never know, Ekstrom told himself. Never. Ryan and Nogal will never believe me. They will never believe in the flying whale. They're explorers, simple men of action, unimaginative. Of course, I'm an explorer too, but I'm different, I'm sensitive. Ekstrom was riding for a fall. The traction scooter was going up a slope that had been eroded concave. It was at the very top of the half-moon angle, upside down, standing Ekstrom on his head. Since he was not strapped into his seat, he fell. As he fell, he thought ruefully that he had contrived to have an accident in the only way possible with a traction scooter. Ekstrom's cranium collided with the ground and he stopped thinking. Ekstrom blinked, opened his eyes, wondering. He saw light, then sky, then pigs. Live pigs. But the pigs shouldn't be alive. When he was this close, they should be dead. Only they weren't. Why? Why? He moved slightly, and the nearest pig fell dead. The others went on with their business, roaming the plain. Ekstrom expected the dropping of the pig to stampede the rest into dropping dead, but they didn't seem to pay any attention to their fallen member. I've been lying here for hours, he realised. I didn't move in on them. The pigs moved in on me while I was lying still. If I keep still, I can get a close look at them in action. So far, even with video, it had been difficult to get much of an idea of the way these creatures lived when they weren't dead. Observe, observe, he told himself. There might be some relationship between the flying whale and the pigs. Could it be the whales were intelligent alien masters of these herd of pigs? Ekstrom lay still and observed. Item. The pigs ate the soft, moss-like grass. Item. The pigs eliminated almost constantly. Item. The pigs fought regularly. Fought? Fought? Here was something, Ekstrom realised. Why did animals fight? Rationalisations of nature lovers aside, some fought because they had plain, mean, nasty dispositions, like some people. That didn't fit the pigs. They were indolent grazers. They hadn't the energy left over for sheer cussedness. There had to be a definite goal to their battles. It wasn't food. That was abundant. The grassy veldt reached to all horizons. Sex. They had to be fighting for mates. He became so excited he twitched a foot slightly. Two more pigs dropped dead, but the others paid no heed. He watched the lazily milling herd intently, at the same time keeping an eye out for the flying whales. Back on Earth, porpoises had been taught to herd schools of fish and of whales. It was not impossible an intelligent species of whale had learned to herd masses of land animals. But Ekstrom knew he needed proof. He had to have something to link the pseudo-death of the warthogs to the inexplicable presence of the whales. 
Perhaps, he thought, the death of the pigs was the whale's way of putting them into cold storage, a method of making the meat seem unattractive to other animals on a world perhaps without carrion scavengers. Something was stirring among the pigs. One undersized beastie was pouring the dirt, a red eye set on the fattest animal in sight. Then Shorty charged Fatso, but abruptly a large raw-boned critter was in Shorty's path, barring him from Fatso. Faced by Big Boy, Shorty trembled with rage and went into a terrible temper tantrum, rolling on the ground, pouring it in a frenzy, squealing in maddened rage. Then Shorty was on his feet, desperate determination showing in every line of his body. With heedless, desperate, foolhardy courage, he charged Big Boy. Big Boy took the headlong charge in his side with only a trifling grunt. Shorty bounced ten feet in the light gravity and grimly wallowed to his feet. He levelled an eye at Big Boy, and his legs were pumping in frenzied fury again. Big Boy shifted his kilos of weight casually and met Shorty head on. The tremendous crack reverberated from the bluff behind Ekstrom. Shorty lay on the ground. No, Ekstrom thought. He isn't dead. His sides were pumping in and out, but he was knocked cold. Ekstrom had to sympathise with him. He had never seen a more valiant try against insurmountable odds. Big Boy was ambling over towards Fatso, apparently to claim his prize. Fatso apparently was the sow. But Big Boy stalked on past Fatso. She squealed after him tentatively, but he turned and blasted her back with a bellowing snort. Ekstrom watched the scene repeated with other actors several times before he was sure. The older males, the Big Boys, never collected the favours of the harem for themselves. Instinctively, the pigs were practising birth control. The older males abstained and forced the younger males to do the same. On a world like this, Ekstrom's first thought was of death. He thought, these pigs must be like lemmings deliberately trying to destroy their own race, to commit geno-suicide. But that didn't answer any of the other questions about the pseudo-death, the alien whales. And then Ekstrom thought not of death, but of life. Chapter 4. The traction scooter was where he had left it, hanging upside down on the underside of the concave slope. It had stopped automatically when his weight had left the seat. He reached up, toggled the override switch, and put it manually into reverse. Once straightened out, he was on his way back to base. I feel good, he thought. I feel like I could lick my weight in spacemen. Only then did he realise why he felt so good. What had happened had been so strange for him, he couldn't realise what it had been until now. While he had been knocked out, he had been asleep. Asleep. For the first time in years. Sleep. He felt wonderful. He felt like he could lick all of his problems. Ekstrom roared back into the base. The motor was silent on the traction scooter, of course, but the air he kicked up made its own racket. Ryan and Nogal came out to greet him sullenly. Listen, he told them, I've got the answer to all of this. So have we, Ryan said ugly. The first answer was the right one. We've been scaring pigs to death and watching them, scaring and watching. We learned nothing. You knew we wouldn't. You set up for this. It's like you said. You fed all of these beasts your stuff in advance. Something that acts when they get excited. It didn't make sense. But then, it never had. You couldn't argue with prejudice. He was different. He didn't act like they did. He didn't believe the same things. He was the outsider, therefore suspect. The alien on an alien world. Ekstrom sighed. Man would always be the final alien. The creature man would never understand, sympathise with, or even tolerate. There was no point in trying to argue further, Ekstrom realised. You'll never understand, Ryan. You could have seen all the things I saw if you'd bothered to look. But you were too anxious to blame me. But if I can't make you understand, I can at least beat you into acceptance. 
Huh? Ryan ventured. I said, Ekstrom repeated, that I'm going to beat some sense into your thick skull. Ryan grinned, rippled his massive shoulders, and charged. Ekstrom remembered the lesson Shorty had taught him with Big Boy. He didn't meet the captain's charge head on. He sidestepped and caught Ryan behind the ear with his fist. The big man halted, puzzled. Ekstrom sank his fist into the thick, solid belly. Slowly, Ryan's knees gave way and he sank towards the ground. When his chin was at the right level of convenience, Ekstrom put his weight behind his right. Ryan swayed dreamily backward, but he threw himself forward on one ham of a fist connected high on Ekstrom's cheek. He was shaken to his toes, and the several hours old pain in the back of his head throbbed sickeningly. One more like that would do for him. Ekstrom stood and drove in a lot of short punches to Ryan's body, punches without much power behind them because he didn't have it, but he knew better than to try a massive attack on a massive target. When he couldn't lift his arms any more, Ekstrom stopped punching. He realised Ryan had fallen in his face a few seconds before. Then he remembered and whirled. He had left his back exposed to Nogal. Nogal smiled. I'm not drawing hazard pay. After a while, Ekstrom stopped panting and faced Nogal and the captain, who was now sitting, rubbing his jaw. Okay, he said. Now you'll listen or I'll beat your skulls in. I know what's behind all of this on this planet. Yeah? What do you think it is, Stormy? Ryan asked. First of all, I think there's a basic difference between this world and any other the XP has investigated. Now what could that be? Nogal wanted to know with a tiny smile. These worlds are close. The gravity is low. You wouldn't need much more than a jet plane to get from one of these planetoids to another. Some animals have developed with the power to travel from one of these planetoids to another, like a squid jetting out of water. They harnessed some natural power system. What does that prove? Ryan wanted to know. It proves that this world and others in this belt are prepared for interplanetary travel. It's probably a part of their basic evolutional structure, unlike that of heavy independent planets. This false dying is part of their preparation for interplanetary visitors. Why would these aliens want others to think that they were dead? Ryan asked. Correction, Captain. They wanted visitors to believe that they can die. Ryan blinked. Meaning that they can't die? That's right. I think everything on this planet has immortality, Ekstrom said. I'm not exactly sure how. Maybe it has to do with the low radiation. Every individual cell has a memory of the whole creature. But as we age, that memory becomes faulty. Our cells forget how to reproduce themselves exactly. Here, that cell memory never fades. Bodies renew themselves indefinitely. But why hide it? Nogal asked. This planetoid can just support so many creatures. They practice birth control among themselves, the surveyor said. The natives naturally want to discourage colonisation. Ryan whistled. Once we report this, every rich and powerful man in the Federation will want to come here to live. There's not enough space to go around. There will be wars over this little hunk of rock. Nogal's hard, dark eyes were staring into space. There's only one sensible thing to do. We'll keep the world to ourselves. I don't like that kind of talk, Ryan growled. Ryan, this little ball of dirt isn't going to do the Federation as a whole any good, but it can be of value to us. We can make ourselves comfortable here. Later on, we can bring in some women, any women we want. Who wouldn't want to come here? Ryan began to argue, but Ekstrom could see he was hooked. The man who risked his life, the man who sought something new and different, the explorer, was basically an unstable type removed from the mainstream of civilization. Nothing was liable to change that. 
By nightfall, Ryan and Ekstrom had agreed. We'll have to keep a constant watch, Ryan was saying. We'll have to watch out for XP scouts looking for us. Or, after a few generations, another ship may come to complete the mapping. Nogal smiled. We'll have to keep an eye on each other too, you know. One of us may get to wanting more room for more women, or to have children, a normal biological urge. Death by violence isn't ruled out here. I don't like that kind of talk, Ryan blustered. Nogal smiled. Ekstrom thought of the others, of the sleepless, watchful nights ahead of them. That was probably his trouble, all of his life. He didn't trust people. He had to stay awake and keep an eye on everybody. Well, he would be one ahead here. Of course, it was wrong not to trust anybody, but Ekstrom knew habit patterns were hard to break. Sleep is a habit. Ryan and Nogal were jarred awake in the night by the spaceship blasting off without them. They ran out and shook their tiny fists in fury at the rising flame. Operating a spaceship alone was no cinch, but it could be done. Ekstrom would get back to the nearest Federation base and report the planetoid without death. He didn't have absolute confidence in any government, no. But he suspected the Federation could do more with the world than two men like Ryan and Nogal. Ekstrom took his fingers off the punch board and lay back on his couch. He yawned. Ryan and Nogal were slow. But in time, they might have learned to do without sleep, and to guard their treasure night and day. Fortunately, Ekstrom knew from long experience what the two others didn't. An eternity without sleep isn't worth the price. End. End of The Planet With No Nightmare by Jim Harmon Recording by Graham Walker, Ipswich, Suffolk